So we're absolutely delighted to have Evan van der Veer here with us today. Evan van der Veer is a managing partner of Vanship Capital, previously serving on the board of directors of Dietrex Corporation, a former firm investment. Prior to Vanship, Mr. van der Veer was an investment analyst at Aegis Financial Corporation, where he helped expand idea generation to include international equities. Evan van der Veer received a Bachelor of Business Administration with a concentration in finance from George Washington University. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. van der Veer. Thanks, Tatai. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, congratulations on all your other interviews. They're really terrific. Excellent. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And so our first question today is, how do you generate investment ideas and what is your investing framework? Well, th those are uh, great questions. I, I would say it, it's evolved uh, like, like many things over the, the years that uh, we've been doing this. We, we started out uh, sort of the more classic Ben Graham um, sort of style of investing, screening and, and looking for very quantitatively cheap um, securities, typically on, on price to earnings or EV to EBIT or, or price to uh, tangible book or something along those lines. And um, historically, we've noticed that, uh, not surprisingly, uh, particularly over recent years, the, the better businesses don't ever get into those, those uh, categories. Those tend to be businesses that that really maybe are, are better off uh, liquidating than, than continuously operating. So um, over, over that time, we've uh, noticed that uh, screening for things uh, in, the, in that same way is, is quite difficult. And in fact, it, it's better to sort of invert and, and, and uh, look for the best businesses and, and then try to figure out if, if it's trading at a fair price. So so um, in terms of that's how we, we sort of go about it, we look around the world uh, for, as I say, these sort of rock stars off the beaten path um, that, that haven't fully maybe been discovered or, or haven't, you know, that their, their growth runway ahead of them is not fully recognized. Um, in terms of the framework where we're looking for specifically, uh, we, we tend to be looking outside the United States. Our, our core belief is that still uh, many of these foreign markets are, are still uh, less efficient. Um, even, for instance, the United Kingdom is our belief, even though obviously it's a developed market, it, it tends to be quite a bit more off the beaten path than uh, the United States. And so um, we um, are open to looking at many things um, in, these, in these countries and try not to be too uh, prescriptive or, or too limiting in terms of our search process. But uh, as I say, generally, we're looking for that, that rock star, the, the founder, owner, operator that owns 25, 30% of a business that really has that ability to shift the business and, and take the business in the direction that they so desire. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And you are, of course, very global with your approach. Uh, there's only really two stock markets, from my understanding, uh, in two regions that you've decided to sort of actively eliminate, the U.S. and China. You've already spoken about why you've eliminated the U.S. Can you discuss why you've eliminated uh, China from your stock market research as well? Yeah, there's nothing specifically against China, and, and we've had businesses that operate there um, that that uh, that are listed in Hong Kong and so on. It, it, to us, um, and 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 we've looked at some things in China recently. We we haven't yet invested, but to, to us, at particularly um, besides sort of the, the biggest companies in the country, um, it's very difficult to understand the, the local um, uh, politics. Uh, you know, who, who's uh, who's reputable, who's not, who's and so on and so forth. So it's been our it's been our belief over time that uh, generally the firms that have a team on the Around. It's very hard to compete, particularly in that country, in our opinion, with someone, another firm that has 10 people on, on the ground there. But, but maybe that'll change. So um, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's on a forever do not touch list, but um, it, it's uh, just been the case uh, so far at this point in time. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And I know you've publicly released some, uh, some discussion about how you uh, feel about Caspi in relation to the recent events that occurred in Kazakhstan. Can you discuss more a little bit about your thinking regarding that? Yeah, sure. Obviously, it was a sad and tragic event. Um, it was quite surprising right at the beginning of the year. Um, obviously, uh, some of these post-Soviet countries are uh, more or less stable, and, and our belief generally was that Kazakhstan was a, a relatively one of the more stable countries, and that continues to be our, our belief today. Um, the, the good news is, uh, aside from the, obviously the, the casualties on the ground, um, of which I believe there are a few hundred, and, and some of the turmoil that went on for those few days, it seems like uh, things have generally stabilized, um, and, and so hopefully uh, the country can continue on. Its, its path of sort of economic reforms and, and privatizations and so on, although they may be uh, a bit delayed because of these circumstances. As it relates to Caspi, our understanding is that uh, it was very minimal disruption. Option, only a few, two or a few days where they were um, obviously disruptions in Almaty uh, relating to the e-commerce and, and so on. But uh, it sounds like 
um, that uh, things got got right back going quickly. And the people that wanted to buy things and process payments that were delayed by a day or two uh, obviously got quickly around to doing so. And and so um, yeah, we we haven't changed our mind that uh, obviously Cosby is um, you know has an exceptional future ahead. And um, I'm sure there'll be more bumps in the road uh, both in that country and others. But um, we think they'll be in the best place to overcome them. Any one of their competitors. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And do a key um, a key part of your investment strategy is, of course, a focus on moats. Um, overall, compared to in the past, do you believe that it's getting easier for companies to maintain their moats as a result of global scale or harder for companies to maintain their moats because of the rapid pace of technological change? It's a great question. Um, and again, maybe it's something we've changed our mind on. I, you know, I, I've um, been thinking a lot about and, and studying sort of how, uh, you know, historically speaking, when, when you had an asset heavy business or a more cyclical business, that the only way to, to grow was obviously to buy another steel mill, to buy, you know, to lay another mile of, of railroad track. And obviously that costs money. Um, Buffett and others have been uh, early on to the um, idea that many of these businesses are, are basically uh, don't need any dollar, extra dollar of capital to, to expand. And, and so uh, when you have a situation like that, um, it seems to me that the biggest companies in the world, uh, once they become that powerful and everyone is looking at them and using them, um, that uh, that's going to be very hard to to dislodge them from from those positions, um, but obviously it's it's only maybe ten to twenty years into this phenomenon, and, and maybe um, you know things will change. But but um, the idea that basically um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the the, uh, the you, you may recall there's a sort of a Harvard a Business School report about it. I think it was maybe called Armstrong, but maybe I'm off on that. We could add it later. But basically the whole idea that the economy, the way things work, ha has changed, and maybe this time is indeed the case. So we we've certainly tried to open our mind to uh, understanding those businesses and and. Um, recognizing how, how they work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And um, something that's been a bit more of a trend recently is you have a lot of uh, private equity and some venture capital firms that are uh, listing on the stock market. Uh, you have an investment in one of those, uh, Georgia Capital. Can you discuss a yes. little bit how you analyze those types of companies? Yeah, of course. I, I think, um, yes, you're, you're right. And they, there are some complexity, obviously, to those. And then in some ways, it, it makes it easier because they, they have to give you maybe a, a bit more transparency than they normally would on the underlying business and how it's doing. Um, in, in the case of Georgia Capital, it's it, in our view, it's a collection of some of the better businesses in the Republic of Georgia. It's, uh, some of some of the viewers may know it's it's a former Soviet uh, Republic uh, country, um, and um, it, it's been uh, one of the best reforming countries it, it, um, since the independence. There's about four million people there. It's it's very very pro business, very uh, low actually no corporate tax, assuming you reinvest the capital. And so uh, in the case of Georgia Capital, they have a collection of some of the better businesses in the country, including in the healthcare, in banking, um, and and so on. And um, so yeah, it, we we analyze it sort of going through and, and trying to come up with our view of, of that asset value. Of course, the company has their view and, um, and uh, we, we try to come up with our own sort of on, on reasonable assumptions and see how comfortable with, we, uh, with the valuation compared to what, what we're willing to pay for the business. But um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting trend. And, and particularly over recent years, I would say the last few years, holding companies are, are definitely not in favor, at least in, in, in general, um, there's exceptions. So it's, it's interesting to see how those management teams take advantage or don't take advantage of the, the perennial discount that their shares are trading in the case of Georgia Capital is probably 50%. So um, obviously the management we think is wise in, in repurchasing those uh, their shares that are that are out in the market. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, the logic makes a lot of sense. And in one of your previous interviews, you mentioned that you believe that uh, the net promoter score is the best measure of customer satisfaction. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Why do you think that's the best measure? Yeah, sure. I appreciate the question very much. And uh, we've been thinking a lot about that. I, I would say um, it's sort of an elementary thing, as, as we mentioned a little bit in that presentation, or an elementary idea that at the end of the day, every business exists to be serving their customer, right? Either they're providing a product or a solution that that customer uh, needs or wants or, or what have you. And um, if they're not doing that, then then there's a problem, maybe not tomorrow or the next week, but eventually uh, something is going to break down. And um, so particularly over the long term. So our, our view uh, then is, well, how do you best measure that? And it's become interesting that the fact that there is no real standardized way to do that. Obviously, over time, if if a business is attracting customers and, and uh, making a lot of money, then probably something is going right, but that's not necessarily always the case. And so um, we've become quite interested in trying to figure out how to measure that. And, and as I said, there's no standardized way. There are certain industry reports and other things uh, to try to get at that. Um, and I want to mention a book, which of course I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but uh, 
Fred Reichheld, who, who came up with that uh, the sort of net promoter score concept that we mentioned that presentation since that presentation just released a book. Um, I think it's called something delighting something uh, it just came out in December. So uh, anyway, there, there's more in that about how many of the companies that, that um, we know and love the big companies like Nike and others are, are delighting customers and not surprisingly have high net promoter scores. Um, but it, but it's not something, as I say, that could be easily measured necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And um, can you discuss a little bit how you evaluate management? Sure. Um, I, I would say that the management um, quality aspect comes down a lot more to sort of an art than science. So um, over the years, we've tried to um, get at sort of develop a checklist, I, I guess, a mental checklist in our mind about what some of the things we look for. Um, and we've written to some extent about some of these, but I, I would say um, things that, you know, people that, that are not salesy, that are more humble, there, there's many sort of personality traits uh, that, that are sort of tend to be lo low key and, and how they operate, maybe not having the fanciest offices right downtown, maybe outside the city. Um, we, we love to sort of see the contrarian activities, meaning uh, share or purchase is during you know set periods of, of distress, um, making investments uh, in, in facilities, etc., uh, in the team during periods of distress, uh, those kinds of things. So the way we go about it is uh, during normal times, uh, we, we tend to travel and and meet uh, with the management teams and really try to understand what's driving them. Right. So you may read an annual report, you may read a, a quarterly earnings call, but at the end of the day, that doesn't really get to what is driving them. So we we sort of love to try to understand their history. Um, going back even to their childhood, what, what, how they ended up where they are, you know, wh why do they get up in the morning and what are their big ideas for the next five to 10 years? You know, what, what are they benchmarking themselves on? We don't necessarily want to hear stock performance or, you know, for the next year or something like that. We obviously much prefer to hear, you know, building the value, the intrinsic value of the business over the next 10 years or something. So um, we could get much more into that, but, but I think um, really trying to understand that the, the person at the end of the day, they're, they're human like anyone else and trying to understand what, what they're thinking about, what motivates them. And that takes a a lot of time and, and a lot of effort in conversation rather than um, than just reading a, a simple report and, and making a decision uh, at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And are there specific types of moats that you prefer to other types of moats? So low cost provider, uh, brands, um, switching costs, etc. Are there ones that you prefer over other types of moats? Again, that's changing. I, I would say, um, uh, obviously, uh, some moats, at least in theory, are stronger than others. And and uh, but but again, maybe that's in theory rather than practice. Um, I, we historically have liked things where obviously it's a low percentage. The the product that is being developed um, is, is a low percentage of the end cost. In other words, and and that sort of ties in with the switching cost, right? If if it's if it's not a high um, a high percentage of the end product, then there's really not a lot of and and you're not raising your price that much, then there's not a lot of reason to switch. Um, I, I would say it, it sort of goes back to what you asked about net promoter score at the end of the day. To me, it, that's sort of all, that is the moat, right, in, in a lot of sense. And so some of all those things uh, sort of tie into that. If, if you are, uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, no, nobody's going to want to switch if you are, are providing good service at a fair price. So they, they sort of all go together. I would say there's different frameworks that we've used. And, and again, that, that changes over time as, as, um, as business models change and, and the world changes. That's very interesting. And um, we, we discovered that you've been finding some home builders attractive recently, Glenfay and Countryside Properties. Are you yes. finding the sector as a, are you finding uh, the industry as a whole attractive or are you finding something specifically about those attractive? Yeah, so we, we've done uh, quite a bit of work on the home building industry over the years. And uh, I guess like many other industries, uh, people tend to, to uh, paint it with a one brushstroke. In other words, they, they all think that all home builders are the same. So it, it turns out that in certain countries like France um, and some of the Nordics, I think Sweden and others, home builders are actually an extremely uh, high return on capital business. They actually never own the land. They're seen more as a sort of a consultant business. So in France, if you want to build a home, my understanding, you you hire a home builder as sort of a consultant and you bring the land to them and say, I want to build this home here and they help you do that and, and so on. So there's not a lot of their capital, if any, tied up in it. Obviously, that, that's different in the U.S. And, and other countries where you have sort of this idea of land banks and, and home builders buying you know, 10 years of land and then building it out. We, we had an investment in a company uh, called Directional, which is down in, in Brazil, which is another sub-segment where, uh, which is, it touches on uh, countryside, one of the home builders we own currently, uh, of affordable homes. So again, in, in those cases, the, the government was basically helping those builders fund the land purchases and the, the buyers. So the return on capital was much, much better and obviously much more stable when you have the government behind you. Um, so to answer your question as a blanket statement, no, we, we find uh, these few exceptions uh, in the home building market um, of uh, 
of, of interest. Um, Glenvay, the first one you mentioned, is the Irish home builder, and, and that in itself is a little bit different. As you may know, the, the Irish home market uh, basically completely imploded uh, in the financial crisis in 08 and 09. I think the average, uh, I can't recall if it's land price or residential price, was down something like 80% from, from top to bottom. And um, the reason was because everyone was using leverage and it was a house of cards and, and uh, a rather unsophisticated industry at that point in time. There, there were no large uh, scale home builders really at that point. And so now fast forward today, you have two large home builders, uh, Glen Bay and Cairn, which uh, hopefully when, the, when they're sort of scaled up should each represent about 10% of the market. And obviously they have a huge uh, you know, cost advantage in terms of um, uh, product and, and uh, scale. Um, they also have a large sophistication advantage and, and frankly now a brand advantage. So, so that's the unique thing on Glen Bay and countryside um, is a bit more like the Brazilian home builder. So countryside uh, as part of their business, the partnership business, and, and which should shortly become their whole business. Um, they partner with local housing authorities, uh, housing associations, um, at local governments, basically, and, and other groups to uh, what they do call sort of regenerate an area. So if you have areas outside London, northern UK, all over the country, where maybe a certain development or area of town was built in the 1950s, and, and really the homes have, have degenerated and, and uh, very, very importantly, are, have become econ um, in, sorry, uh, energy uh, in, energy inefficient, basically. And so really the only way to fix this is by more or less redoing the entire place. So countryside will come in um, and in fact build roads and help build schools and all kinds of infrastructure and literally uh, change the entire place. I importantly, um, they will not take control over the vast majority of the land until they're actually building on it. So this um, has led historically to returns on invested capital of, of north of 70%. We're, we're hopeful that that remains uh, above 40% over, over a long period of time. But again, uh, both of these, I would say, are exceptions, uh, exceptional home builders, not the, uh, not the uh, general home builder. It's very intriguing. And why do you believe that the market's developed in such a way where some country, where uh, countries like the U.S., their home builders have high capital intensity and own the land, and countries like France, they have low capital intensity and don't own the land? Yeah, it's a, it's a really excellent question. And in fact, even in the U.S., as you may know, that there's actually exceptions here. So there's a company uh, based not too far from where I'm sitting uh, here in Virginia called NVR, which which has used options historically. So it's sort of another way, a synthetic way of, of sort of running in an asset light manner. Um, I, I guess it goes back to history. It's some point. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, completely sure of that. In, in Ireland, uh, for instance, uh, Glen Bay is also now trying to use options to increase their capital efficiency. And um, I, I think probably it has to do with the sophistication of the market. Um, here in the U.S., people are allowed to and, and trusting of, uh, of people that offer them options, maybe in countries where the, the rule of law is not as strong. Obviously, they'd be more suspect of a home builder offering them you know, uh, an option to buy their property in three years or something like that. So I, I suspect maybe sort of rule of law and, and uh, just culture and the way things have done in history is, is probably a big part of your answer or the answer to your question, excuse me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I think. And another one of your investments is uh, Jet2. Um, yeah. How do you see how do you see um, it in regards to uh, travel recovery from COVID? And do you have any estimates for when you're expecting the company will return to a positive operating income? Yeah, so uh, a great question. Uh, my answer probably would have been different a year ago than, than it is now. Um, it, it's obviously been a long uh, struggle with that Jet2, at least uh, during the COVID period. So we, we have a long history with Jet2. We actually first invested in the company, um, I believe, uh, 12 years ago or so in, in 2010, um, owned the shares uh, for some period, maybe a few years then, um, and, and, um, and then uh, sold our shares and then have, have uh, purchased, uh, invested back into the company in, in 2020 to around COVID, as you say. Um, obviously, the, the impact has been uh, quite severe. Uh, the company uh, related, it's, it went into the crisis with a, a, a quite a strong balance sheet. Uh, particularly compared to its peers. And so that has allowed it obviously to not only uh, stay in business and, and uh, continue to, to um, operate when they're allowed, but also in our opinion, to uh, sort of set them up to thrive coming out the other side. Um, so we would expect um, uh, hopefully this year, this summer, the summer of 2022, the calendar year, uh, which is different than their fiscal year, should be quite strong. I'm, I'm not sure about you and your friends, but everyone that I talk to is uh, particularly over there is, is really uh, desperate to, to uh, you know, get to the beach. And, and so um, uh, as it stands on the regulations, it appears that um, the UK has gotten rid of uh, the vast majority of their, their COVID restrictions. And we'll see about these other countries, uh, Greece and Spain over the, over the summer. But um, obviously, like everyone else, we're hopeful that the COVID is um, at least, uh, you know, going to become uh, endemic in history soon. And um, the Jet2 uh, 
um, will will exit with a um, you know a very strong business. I, I should note they've actually added a, a large aircraft order during the downturn here to to take advantage of this. Um, and um, not surprisingly, their their net promoter scores and customer satisfaction rankings compared to everyone else are are, are uh, not even in the same zip code. So um, I, I won't bore you with all the sort of market market share dynamics, but needless to say, we think that Jet2 um, will be growing their market share quite substantially uh, post COVID. And Denmark and Norway have also just gotten rid of the restrictions, so hopefully that should uh, probably help that as well. Um, exactly. And how do you find? And how do you find generally these types of opportunities, you know, uh, Jet2, uh, some of the other opportunities we discussed, countryside properties, um, Caspi, how have you found those kinds of opportunities? Do you use, let's say, for example, stock screeners at all? Is it more coming across, you know, um, articles about, let's say, more uh, sectors or industries? Or how do you find these types of opportunities? Yeah, so we, we used to run screens, and um, as we moved sort of away from the quantitative focus, uh, we've re- recognized that it's very, very difficult to, to screen, uh, even for the, these sort of uh, rock stars off the beaten path, as we like to call them. Uh, part of that is obviously you, you can look for strongly performing businesses, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this uh, person, he or she is an exceptional exceptional manager necessarily. So uh, what we've tried to do is just look at, at many, many things, right? And, and try to understand uh, business dynamics, understand new business models. And um, to a large extent, once you do that, then you're in a much better position to be able to find someone uh, like I described. Um, we also used to travel to markets and, and look for quantitatively cheap stocks. So we would go to Greece, we'd go to Hong Kong, Brazil, what have you, and, and try to meet the cheapest companies that we could. Instead, now we, we sort of, uh, again, invert it and say, who are the, the best managers here uh, in this place? And we want to meet them. And, and so um, in, in that way, it's the price may not be right at that point in time. But generally speaking, over some period of time, it, it may get into a price uh, zone that we find uh, sufficiently attractive. Um, in the case of Jet2, we had known it for a long time. Actually, at one point, it was trading at a very, very cheap price. I think it was trading at 70% of tangible book value and about four times earnings, uh, if I recall, back in 2010. Um, and some of the other businesses you mentioned, Countryside, uh, we had been studying the UK home building market, um, some of the unique natures that I mentioned of that um, so for some years. And, and Caspi was a bit of an interesting situation because it, it was quantitatively cheap, although I think we found it from, from our uh, sort of um, network of brokers, local brokers in, in some of these foreign uh, countries that, that uh, uh, we try to become very good clients of. And, and so uh, we, I think uh, IPO, Cosby was IPOing and we come across it like that and, and sort of quickly realized that uh, Mikhail Lomtadze is, uh, is one of these rock star CEOs that we're looking for. So we didn't, we didn't hesitate too long on that one to, uh, to invest in the business. That's, that's very interesting. And I want to also gauge, you discussed valuation a bit, and I want to sort of gauge, you know, how you think about valuation. Let's say, for example, you had a company that you knew, you know, it had, let's say, a very, very strong moat, and you knew for sure it was going to keep having, let's say, the free cash flow level that it has today for perpetuity, but it would have no revenue growth or decline. What uh, type of multiple, let's say, free cash flow do you think you would about be willing to pay for such a business? Yeah, I, without getting too uh, mathematical or scientific, uh, I, I would say not not so high, right? And 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 I I guess you could come up with that with off the bond yields. Effectively, what you're 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 suggesting is sort of some kind of uh, you know twenty year ten year bond essentially. So you could sort of price that off of the the uh, cost of risk in a given country or something. That's sort of generally how I'd approach that. Um, and and we think about it the same way as as others in in the sense of um, if the business is growing, well then growing how much and 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 um, and what kind of business, how, how much are we willing to pay for it? But um, we've sort of shifted our focus from those, those uh, stagnant businesses, because at the end of the day, if the business is indeed stagnant and not growing at all, probably eventually it's going to be going in the wrong direction. And we'd much prefer to find the businesses that are growing and, and um, increasing value over time. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And I also understand, so you transitioned from, let's say, more like Graham style stocks to more like present day Warren Buffett approach. What were some of, let's say, the major challenges you found when looking at Graham stocks that convinced you to switch over to more of a modern Buffett approach? Well, there are many challenges in hindsight. Um, I would say... um... Well, just just to step back, I, the, the first thing challenge is obviously uh, it, you, we could go around the math, but when you when you're running a 20 stock or 15 stock portfolio, and you have to if you're investing maybe with a two to three year timeline, right, and you're you're investing in a given company at at 50 cents on the dollar, you're buying it for 50 cents and selling it at 90 cents, just as an example, you're you're sort of constantly on this idea treadmill, right, and so you're you're basically having to replace. I don't know, you know, three to five stocks, maybe more each year. And that results in sort of a constant, you know, treadmill for lack of a better description. Um, 
it, when we were younger, uh, we thought that that was for some reason a pleasant activity. Um, and uh, maybe because we wanted, it was exciting to run around finding treasures around the world that we could buy cheap and, and sell eventually. Um, as, as we've learned in maturity, it's become obvious that I, I think, uh, and many others have figured this out before we had, but I, I think one in, in that way, you couldn't study the businesses as well uh, as you can if you're owning them for five or 10 or more years, right? So obviously, if you're sort of just buying them and selling them out, once the price goes up, you never really get into the full dynamics uh, of the business and understand the drivers and variables that really matter. So um, I, I would say that that that's so it's at a high level that that's the answer. I, I would say at a lower level, obviously, that when we were buying quantitatively cheap, you end up with businesses that um, have worse surprises. They, they t tend to um, uh, negatively surprise their, the, the management maybe is over promising and under delivering or a competitor, maybe nothing to do with management. Maybe a competitor comes along and, and takes their business or, or something like that. And, and we've had crazy situations where um, I won't use the name, but something comes to mind in the UK where literally uh, the, the management team left, the, the former management left and went down the street and set up the exact same business and basically started stealing all of the, the not only employees, but the business of the, the original. We didn't own that, that uh, investment, thankfully. Um, others, we, we joke in some of our letters that we were invested in a, again, nameless company in Australia where um, the CEO just told us that he was leaving. And when we asked where he was going, we, he told us that he was going back to business school as a student. And, and needless to say, looking at the record of that company, you, you would understand why he needed to go back to business school. But so yeah, it, getting rid of some of that, uh, I, I would say uh, those, those elements of investing in lower quality businesses has been a pleasant thing. Uh, the, the better businesses obviously tend to, although obviously they have negative surprises as well, tend to um, you know, uh, perform well over time and under promise and over deliver. And, that, and that's another big element of some of the, the management that we're looking for people that that are inherently conservative in, in the way they, they operate things. Um, but yeah, owning better businesses and, and letting them do their thing seems like a much better idea than, than uh, investing in these smaller, lower quality businesses, although obviously you can do well with those as well. So what, when, what year really represented your transition where you switched from, let's say, more Graham style to more of a modern Buffett style? Um, I, I would say no one point, right? So it's not like I can say this date uh, necessarily we, we uh, changed the way we do things. It, it was an evolution, as we call it, uh, friends of ours, um, colleagues, all kinds of folks that we had obviously been discussing uh, everyone's sort of unique niche strategy uh, over the years and and um, are big fans of people like Chuck Ockrey and, and Buffett and Lou Simpson and many of these others that, that tend to uh, follow the more buy and hold approach. And um you know, had had great admiration for what they were doing, but couldn't necessarily understand the the multiples they were willing to pay. Um, I, I think learning about um, the business models and and really understanding how powerful these not all, but obviously some businesses are, gave us the comfort and and the ability to to pay a higher multiple than we were paying. Not necessarily unlimited multiple, uh, by the way, but but so, some higher multiple than what we were paying. And and, and I, I guess it goes back to some of the uh, the answers I just mentioned on on the uh, finding it that it was much more enjoyable. Um, the fact that you could get to know the business much, much better if you own it for 10 years rather than if you own it for two years. So th th those were the things. It, it's uh, obviously in hindsight, it, uh, it probably has to do with the fact that we had a sort of a closed-minded approach to some extent uh, to just keep doing what we were doing. And, and maybe during COVID, uh, like other people, we had some time to, like, uh, excuse me, like everyone else, I suppose, we, we had a lot of time to you know, think, think that through and, and reposition the portfolio and um, so far so good on, on, um, on, on sort of what we call VanChap 2.0. Excellent. And uh, let's say there are, uh, and I'm sure there are individuals who want to, let's say, move towards the more modern Buffett approach, but are sort of, let's say, uh, really entrenched in the uh, Graham approach and that it's really tough for them to, you know, even pay, let's say, even for a really great high growing business to pay even, let's say, a um, two digit multiple of free cash flow because they're really used to those really, really cheap um, cigar butt companies, essentially. Is there any sort of uh, materials or readings that really helped you in your journey? Any books, any uh, letters from investment funds that really helped you to transition to that new approach? I, I again, I, I don't know if there's anything specific. I mean, I, I don't mean to dodge your question. I, we we could add some in, and I'm I'm blanking on some of the names, but obviously, you know, uh, letters from from all these these folks that we just discussed. Um, just uh, you know, thinking, trying to be more open minded about the, the business models and and understanding um, them. I, I um, yeah, I, I can't point to sort of any one thing that 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 triggered it. Um, uh, but it, it's it's uh. 
Um, so yeah, if, if, if I, I guess I'll sort of leave it there, but, but, um, just, just probably, I, I guess at the end of the day, being more open-minded about the, the, the material that you're, you're consuming, right. We're consuming the same material that, that you and, and, uh, your cl classmates and, and our colleagues are. And, and so it's just sort of a way, how you interpret that and how you use that in your, in your sort of daily investing practice. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so that's sort of just understanding and again, a greater appreciation. I think maybe the one sort of idea just to think back is, is that sort of crystallizes um, a good friend of ours, um, you know, as sort of, and we sort of compared notes about it is the idea that the world changes, right? And so what, what uh, Graham was doing in, in the 30s and 40s, what Buffett was doing since the 70s, it, it worked in their era. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in our area. And there's a, there's a fine balance here, right? Because you don't want to be caught in, in a situation where you're, you're um, investing in unsustainable things because the, the famous, this time is different situation where you're, you're uh, not using fundamental analysis. You're, you're, you're investing in things that are far too highly priced and in fact are not sustainable uh, businesses. But I, I would say um, that thinking about that and understanding that over time, investors are generally speaking, well, not only investors, people are generally uh, very slow to incorporate new information and new ideas into, into the world. Um, there's a book that I, I always recommend called Engines That Move Markets, I believe is the name. And it was written some years ago by a, um, the deputy to Sir John Templeton. And uh, effectively what the book is, it's a compendium of 10 different case studies in history where a new technology came in and it often took a very, very long time, maybe 10 years for everyone else to recognize the power of that technology. So I, I think the first case study, if I'm not wrong in the book, is, is in the UK in the 1850s where they were still building digging canals while others were laying uh, railroad tracks along the side of the canal. Obviously, the railroad was far more efficient, but the people that were the companies, the, the people, the employees that wanted to build the canals will, were still building and just kept building until obviously at some point they, they, uh, they went out of business. But um, just trying to be open and understanding that we're living in such a short period of history. And I, I guess just to summarize, recognizing that what worked 10, 30 40, 50 years ago is not necessarily what's going to work today and trying to understand, you know, what is likely to work going forward and sort of looking in the other direction is, is a key component of that. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the book rec uh, recommendation. That sounds very exciting. Um, just learning from, let's say, some of your past experience in uh, Vanship Capital 2.0, what do you believe was, let's say, your best previous investment that you made and some of, the, let's say, the thesis behind that and how it played out and then also your worst previous investment that you made and the thesis behind that and how it played out. Yeah, so I, I, I guess our best investment, um, I, I would say Jet2, ironically, may be, um, uh, hopefully going forward will be as well. But it, as I mentioned earlier, it was extremely cheap when we invested and it ended up going uh, quite well. It was actually a lesson as to why uh, buy and hold investing makes a lot more sense. So I, I mentioned that we, we bought it and, and then sold it after a few years. And that was in theory because it got to what we thought was sort of the maximum uh, market share. And, and it, it goes to the lesson of what, when you have fantastic operators, like we believe Philip Meeson, who's the, the executive chairman and 20% shareholder of the company, when you have someone like that in place, they, they tend to uh, go far above and beyond your, your expectations and create new business lines, um, create new optionality that, that you didn't think existed. So, um, and in fact, that was the case. He's continued to make market shares we already discussed and, and uh, we'll, we'll try not to make that mistake again. <laughs> Uh, but when you when you partner with someone like that, remain partners and don't um, don't go the other direction after just a few years. Um, in terms of the worst investment, I, I don't. I, I'll maybe be a bit cautious about getting into names because uh, some of them are still around. I, I, there was a uh, a retail business that comes to mind um, in a developed market that uh, we thought maybe could be turned around that had a great brand at least historically, um, but unfortunately the uh, it was very interesting and it turned into sort of an income trust of, of some persuasion. And so uh, management had decided to sort of use all of the cash to pay to shareholders as dividends instead of reinvesting in the business. And that was because at one point, as I said, it was so strong. Um, and unfortunately, that led to a, a severe degradation of the business. And we were hopeful, as I said, that maybe it could be turned around. Uh, the specific company brought in a, a what seemed to be a very solid manager uh, from an, another competitor business. Um, and unfortunately, it, uh, needless to say, it, it didn't turn uh, very well. And, and so th those kinds of things i not to pick on that one uh, situation um too much but but similar uh, situations where we thought something could be turned and and the business is just uh, of such low quality that that um, it was almost impossible uh, no nobody maybe even the best manager on earth could have turned it around so we, we're gonna try to stop doing that yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense 
And can you discuss a little bit um, what inspired you to start Venture Capital? And also, um, I'm sure there's students that you know dream in the future of becoming fund managers. How do you sort of gain that conviction to say, you know, now is the time to, to start my fund? Yeah, maybe the answer to that is is just complete ignorance. I think it's uh, it's better to have no clue what you're doing than it is uh, if you uh, are, are deep in the details. Um, I, I guess um, the to be serious for a second, the, the real inspiration was uh, going back to people like Sir John Templeton and Peter Kundal and others that that took a truly uh, global approach to sort of value investing or fundamental investing. Um, when I was in school, I, I had uh, you know followed Buffett and, and gone to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings and, and um, followed many of the others that, that you and uh, your colleagues do. And and um, I, I guess to me it's, and my partner David Shapiro, it seemed like there was a huge opportunity that still many many funds were still focused on the United States, and still that's the case today. So even if you have a global fund, quote unquote, m- many of them have you know maybe ninety percent of their assets in in the U.S. and then ten percent in the U.K. and they call that a global fund. So our idea was to sort of find these um, you know, companies, as they say, off the beaten path in, in these different places where uh, many, many others are not looking. Um, I, I guess, uh, personally speaking, what, what uh, pushed me was just the desire to sort of paint my own picture or, or paint my own uh, photo. I, I, um, I had done some internships during school and, and worked for uh, another gentleman named Scott Barbie, who's still a good friend of ours here in, in Northern Virginia, but I, I really had this passion and, and sort of uh, for, for building things um, the way we wanted them, finding the partners, you know, the, the way uh, we thought should be done, and so on and so forth. And, and um, also, I, I had been an entrepreneur since I was younger. I um, started some other businesses in middle and high school and college and so on, and, and uh, grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My dad had started three or four businesses over the years, so it just seemed like a, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, and it, it has been, it's been a lot of fun, but um, I, I would just say um, one of the pieces I always recommend, um, I, th- I, th- I think it's called, you wanna be the next Warren Buffett question mark uh, by Mark Sellers. He, he ran a fund for a long period of time, uh, some back, I, I, you can find it on the internet. It's, it's about 10 page PDF, if I recall correctly. I think it was a, a lecture that he gave at Harvard and um, I would say um, you know, one of the things in there that he talks about, besides many other good points, is sort of the, the, the passion and, and curiosity that you have to have. He, he talks about sort of waking up in the morning and thinking about your stocks and, and in your investments and doing the same before you go to bed. And, and um, if that doesn't fit the description, uh, that's fine. But it, it just probably means that uh, maybe that at least running a fund or starting one is, is not maybe the bad, best idea. It does take a, a tremendous amount of, uh, I would say, tenacity and, and hard work, not only in, in terms of finding investments, obviously building the business and, and finding investors and so on, but it, it, um, it it's definitely, uh, if, if someone sort of only has one foot in, uh, it, it's probably not the best idea. Obviously, it's a it's, it's uh, become a very competitive industry and, and um, like others, only I would say the people that are most dedicated are, are the ones that are going to probably survive to the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And can you uh, please further discuss some of those uh, logistical challenges of running a fund? Yeah, I, uh, there's many. I, I guess one, um, ours in, or our firm in particular, obviously investing overseas. Um, when we got started, it, it's it's still sort of remarkable, but many of these uh, countries still operate in a bit of a, I would say, old school manner in the sense that uh, blocks of truck, uh, st- excuse me, blocks of stock are traded through uh, local brokerages, and and um, those brokers are able to set up meetings and and so on. And it's not so easy necessarily like it is in the U.S. Just pick up the phone and dial the investor relations and get someone on the phone. So so there was whole challenges around um, you know just setting up trading accounts. Uh, getting access to management, obviously travel and, and just that, those kind of logistics. Um, so, so that's, I would say, on the investing and, and maybe relatedly, obviously, getting information. So now, uh, even since we've been um, in business over the last 10 or so years, uh, the information flow from, from CapIQ and Bloomberg and others has, has become a lot better. But even in those days, uh, some of these smaller companies in, in these foreign markets, the information either wasn't there or was completely wrong in, the, in these databases. Um, on the business side of things, um, it, it's hard to, to find people, uh, obviously, to, to invest with you. Um, it, at the end of the day, it's, it largely has to do with trust. And, and so when you start a fund, unless you've been running a fund or doing something else with other, you know, building those relationships, uh, which we had not really been, um, it, it, t- it takes time. And, and uh, our, our view is if you want to do it correctly, it, it should take time, right? If, if someone uh, wants to invest uh, in, in your strategy, you know, at one day after they meet you, I, I guess we tend to get a little bit concerned about that, uh, unless there's some extenuating circumstance. But uh, generally, we like to, to, to find um, 
people to partner with that that uh, truly take a long term view and and therefore want to take time to know and, and trust you. Um, so so I would say those are the the two sides. There there's a, a litany of other challenges I could mention, but but those probably cover at least the, the big ideas I would say. So another challenge I want to ask, I don't know how present it is, and I'm curious to find out, is is there challenges in terms of the language? Have you uh, bought, let's say, businesses that were the management either haven't spoken, spoken English or haven't spoken it well, or for example, the filings were all in another language, um, and what have you done to address some of those if that's been the case? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and the answer may be a bit surprising. Uh, it was particularly to me over time. I, I would say, generally speaking, um, the vast majority of the companies that are listed even in foreign markets, um, and we, we could go through examples, uh, speak have someone that speaks English on the management team or, or something along those lines. Maybe not everyone uh, speaks perfect English. Um, largely, and, and particularly more recently, a lot of the companies do publish English financials. Again, not all, but, but that's um, uh, maybe a self-selecting mechanism in the sense that if they're not publishing English financials, financials, then maybe um, they don't want foreign investors or something. That's not necessarily the case, but we've run into that sometimes. Um, culturally speaking, there, there's two uh, countries that uh, that we've had issues, with, ironically, uh, and not certainly not to pick on these, but in, in Japan, it's, it's traditionally quite difficult to get in touch with um, local management. Uh, they tend to like to work through translators and others, which is obviously just makes it more difficult to maybe get the essence of the, the conversation correct. Um, and the other country, uh, and again, not to pick on them because one of my dear friends is a French gentleman, but France is, is also quite difficult. Um, uh, I, I don't, maybe that's a cultural reason, but uh, um, but yeah, in, aside from those two countries, we've had uh, very, very good luck in terms of getting in access to English financials, um, you know, and again, English uh, speaking management teams, or at least someone on the team that can speak with us. And you mentioned Japan. Uh, were you also looking when you did more of, let's say, a uh, Benjamin Graham style of investing? Were you also looking at Japan at that point? We were, but again, it was it was difficult, right? So we we yeah. would often uh, see something that says, "Oh, you know, I'm sure you followed and, and you interviewed Monish and others, and um, uh, you know, they, it, gentlemen had basket or sorry, managers had baskets of these uh, securities at points in time that were trading at you know a third of cash or or what here and there, and so uh, we we were certainly looking uh, there at those points, but obviously there on the other side, there's also some terrific businesses in Japan that that are now you know catching our attention um, and and have been around, but we just haven't been looking. So so I, like any other. Other sort of developed market, um, you know, the, the, the quality of businesses runs the gamut there. And, and uh, now we're focused on the, the higher quality businesses. But absolutely, in terms of uh, people uh, focused or investors focused on quantitative metrics, obviously, it's uh, in that way, it's, it's a gold mine. And uh, in terms of more of the companies who invest now that have strong moats in Japan, there tends to be, um, I guess, some Two real, there's of course a lot in between, but there's types, there's a uh, huge conglomerates in Japan that have a lot of divisions and a lot of uh, different uh, departments and those types of things. But there's also, uh, from what I've seen, companies who, let's say, you know, they have a very, very strong moat, but they're in, let's say, they make this one very specific part of, for like, let's say, a refrigerator or for a car charger, all of these uh, eccentric types of things. Is there one of those two sorts of, let's say, companies? I mean, they can both have strong moats, but is there one of those types of companies, either the more conglomerate or the more, let's say, niche company that appeals to you more in Japan when looking at those? Yeah, so I, I didn't mean to overstate that we are far from Japanese experts and, and have done some looking at some of the higher quality businesses. But I, I would say um, when I was... Uh, younger some years ago there's a i think it may be still published maybe it's digital now but there was a, a, a product called the japanese company handbook and at that time you could i think each quarter they published it and it was literally a handbook um and uh in there was every single japanese company like maybe a, a half a page on each one and and to your point you would often find uh reading through conglomerates that owned you know funeral homes and golf courses and god knows what else and it was it was in some ways just uh, amusing just to read all the different business lines that a certain group could possibly be in that had nothing to do with each other um, um, as a general rule, I would say we probably prefer the companies that are much more highly focused uh, on, on, you know, providing one product or solution, or at least in a certain area, rather than having uh, businesses and, and things scattered about. But of course, uh, I'm sure you know, Buffett's recently invested in some of the Japanese sort of trading house conglomerates. And, and uh, it's not to say that those aren't good businesses, but I just, I would say from an analytical perspective, uh, for it to fit something for a uh, fit for our uh, uh, strategy, I, I would say, then probably it's one of the more uh, focused, um, maybe not too focused, maybe not one product for a refrigerator, but but uh, certainly, yeah, you know, as I say, focused on one area of, of uh, a certain industry. Absolutely. And you mentioned before that some companies will purposefully only publish financials, let's say, in their uh, home language in order to 
basically discourage foreign investors, why would a company be actively looking to discourage, let's say, foreign investors? Well, that's a good question. And, and probably there's few that are doing uh, what I said, but I, I would say in certain cases, the families, uh, family businesses don't necessarily want outside scrutiny. So it could be that, uh, for instance, maybe it's a second or third generation business that the, um, the, the first or second generation took the company public. And, and now uh, maybe the, the current generation doesn't want the, the necessarily all the scrutiny of, of uh, you know, filing in English. Um, sometimes it's, it's not so much that we, we've ran into some companies over the years. Um, we ran into a company in Greece that was quite small and it was actually extremely well run. They, they just didn't had never had the need for English financials. Nobody had ever asked. And um, we, we asked uh, our, our um, terrific brokers over there if they could set up a meeting with this company myself and a few colleagues and and we went to the office and it turned out that the the management thought we were there to buy the whole company like they they had never they didn't even understand the concept that we were interested potentially in investing in the stock of the business so so anyway i it, it's it, probably very little of it is is sort of mal intent but i but obviously there there's a whole uh, I, I would say generally speaking it probably has to do with family companies or or sort of controlled companies where people don't want uh, more scrutiny that is necessary yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense and uh, what are some permanent changes that you're seeing in the economy that will result or are resulting from the pandemic for the long term? Um, either let's say in terms of specific industries that you think even in the long term will struggle to recover, or maybe some, something macroeconomic that you see as, as troubling that resulted from the pandemic. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, that's the million billion dollar question, obviously, uh, I, we encounter it every day, obviously, people, um, you know, deciding whether they want to work for a firm that makes them go sit in an office, uh, you know, five days a week, uh, eight hours a day or not. And, and um, you know, I, I'm not sure we I have any better answer on, on those. To, to me, uh, obviously, it seems like we've been able to do a decent amount of our work, just speaking for our, our business, uh, personally. Uh, we've been able to do quite a bit of communication, obviously, uh, like we're doing now through through Zoom and other uh, other channels. At the same time, obviously, you you miss uh, a component of of physical interaction, of having a dinner with uh, a CEO and and learning a bit more about their essence than you can in, in just an hour conversation on on um, on a video chat. Um, so yeah, there, there's many, many things. I, I, I guess going forward, we'll, we'll probably travel a little less, uh, you know, go to a few less conferences because we can do some of that like this. Um, I, I do think um, that, that that will be a big part of it. I don't know if, if um, you know, what what uh, altercation will come um, or will be necessary to traditional offices. Um, but I think, you know, things like exercise and gyms, obviously now, you know, um, and maybe this is in the early innings of, of um, you know, people either riding bikes or working out at home um, and, and doing those kind of classes virtually. I, I think um, I think it's um, as, as a fellow uh, fund manager said, it, it brought you know uh, ten years of innovation or, or twenty years of innovation, you know, basically overnight. Right, people needing to buy groceries uh, delivered or wanting their groceries delivered, and I don't know about you, but I think quite a bit of that will will stay. Although some of it will obviously uh, dissipate, um, so we'll see. It, it'll be a fascinating uh, sort of real life example, um, and. Um, I guess the, the good that will come out of it is a lot of these, you know, innovation that, that was not fully adopted is now, you know, increasingly adopted and, and it's making people's lives earlier, uh, sorry, uh, making people's lives easier um, than, than had been before. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. those comments and that perspective. It's very intriguing. And we talked a little bit before about, um, you know, starting a fund in the process of doing so. What type of investors do you think um, people should try and ask for to raise capital when they're just starting out the fund? Is it mostly, let's say, uh, family and friends? Is it more uh, like institutional clients? Is it more um, maybe like higher wealth uh, individuals? Like what, what type of, uh, how would you recommend people to try and raise capital? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm an expert in that area either. Unfortunately, I, I would, I, I guess my my thinking there would be obviously you want to find people that think like you, right? So, so um, you know, traditionally speaking, uh, again, this is a blanket statement and it doesn't apply to all. But fund of funds historically are are difficult uh, for for at least our kind of style uh, because obviously you have multiple layers of different investment committees between you and and uh, the end investor. So maybe maybe to give the, the best answer, I would say to the the investor where the 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 actual person the the is it's their money or or something at the end is the one investing with you directly. So it, as few layers in between you and the actual investor, the better. Um, obviously, family offices and and um, you know business leaders and and um, families and those kinds of things uh, sort of fit the bill on that. Uh, but I I, uh, I have great respect for many of the other institutions and and others. So I I don't mean to say that. 
uh, they, they shouldn't be a fit, but I, I would say just particularly for sort of fundamental long-term investing, uh, finding people that, that uh, think like business owner operators um, and can, can sort of um, uh, maneuver in that way, particularly during difficult periods is, is very, very important. Um, and as I said at the, earlier, I, I think that uh, obviously trust is a huge element in here. And so people that not, not only that can trust you, obviously, but you could trust them that, that uh, they're not going to uh, redeem their money, right? You know, at the, during a panic period of the market, which will inevitably come, I, I think that's a huge part of it. And, and so um, we've been blessed in that, in that regard so far, but it's, it's, it's not an easy task to figure out who, who is, uh, who's a good partner and who's not. And, and um, you know, th those kinds of things over time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it doesn't need, you know, to, to be a business that you own for this next question, because I know, you know, this business might trade at a very high uh, free cash flow multiple, but what business do you think, uh, you can choose any, any business around the world, any company that's listed, do you think has the strongest moat or the strongest business model? Oof, um, that's a good question. I, 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 uh, I don't know if I have a great answer. I, I, I would say, obviously, uh, and this is not an original idea, but, but obviously, uh, you know, Google and, and Facebook and these are, you know, obviously we're using them every day. Apple, you know, uh, as Buffett joked, uh, would anyone in the audience like to give up their iPhone or, or whatnot? And, and uh, obviously the answer is not, you know, no chance. So um, those, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, we, we've been studying over uh, recent years, some of these um, uh, SaaS businesses, uh, sort of software businesses uh, with recurring revenues. And, and there's no question that people uh, like Mark Leonard at Constellation and others were very quick uh, or early on to recognize just how sticky uh, some of those businesses are. I'm not, I, in some cases, they may be better than, than um, a Google or, or something like that. But um, I, I do believe that obviously these businesses that re, you know, require very limited capital to grow and, and, and are just so sticky and intertwined in people's lives, um, at least as it stands now, uh, stand a very good chance of, of remaining in that position, at least for the, the foreseeable future. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And also, um, what is your advice on, let's say, like, how useful do you think within the value investing industry is an MBA or is like a CFA, for example? Yeah. So again, I guess I'll, I'll be a great cautious around being too specific on this topic, but um, I, I think uh, obviously the more work you can do generally in the industry is good. So, um, you know, studying and, and being curious and learning is obviously a good thing. Uh, speaking personally, I, I probably would not have passed the, the CFA exam no, no matter when uh, given. I, I was quite eager to get out in the workforce uh, and actual work instead of uh, in school. I, I'm not one for big, uh, big for sitting in classrooms and, and spending time. Uh, again, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just my, my habit. Um, I, I think, again, certain elements can be useful, obviously, MBA, uh, you know, in terms of networking and, and so on, and, and CFA, some specific financial knowledge that probably um, you otherwise wouldn't necessarily get. Uh, but but um, I, I think, though, at the same time, if you do have that sort of burning passion and desire to, to go make something happen, no matter in, in, in finance or, or uh, frankly, for any business that you're maybe better off uh, as, you know, Gates and Zuckerberg and all these others just getting out there and, and getting going rather than, um, than spending more time, you know, getting credentials that, that people may or may not care about at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And can you talk to us a little bit about how you think about diversification? You obviously run a very concentrated portfolio. How do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I would say we've evolved a, a bit on that. So uh, historically, at any one point, we might have maybe 15 to 20 securities in the, in the uh, portfolio. I, I would say now today, it's probably more like five to eight. And the reason has a lot to do with what we've discussed, right? So, so uh, you know, if you can buy something and really get to know the business and partner with an owner operator, you, you don't necessarily, and, and probably it's not in your interest to invest in the 15th best idea. And um, it's another thing where over time, we've heard many others profess the, the, the power of, of um, concentration and, and focus. Um, we were sort of slow to recognize it, although some would, would suggest that, um, you know, owning maybe six securities is, is insane. We, we think it's probably the most intelligent way to go about it. Again, because we know the business is better. You, you will uh, inherently have higher volatility, obviously, uh, for, for those that, that uh, have an issue or care about that. Uh, we don't, uh, as Buffett put, uh, put it, I think he'd rather have a, a lumpy 15% than a smooth 12, but obviously that's not for everyone. And, um, but at the end of the day, if, if your goal is to, to compound capital over a long period of time, uh, you shouldn't care about the volatility and, and uh, you should by relatively few businesses that, that you're quite um, confident and, and know very well. And so it's really a factor of, of those, those elements that uh, we've come to the, the conclusion that, um, you know, focusing on these five to eight best businesses, there's no sense in putting capital into your 18th best idea at the end of the day. So I, I should note though, in terms of concentration, obviously it's important 
within the five to eight or whatever number one is comfortable with that that there is some level of diversification within those those uh, holdings themselves so obviously we, we have business all over we do have a company in Kazakhstan for instance so we might be cautious around uh, obviously uh, exposure to sort of Russia and, and that region of the, the world and and so we think a lot about how the, the correlations between even these five or six or whatever holdings and and how something a, a geopolitical event or, or just a general economic downturn or so on would impact them so I don't mean to sound dismissive of that we think a lot about that and make sure that they they truly are not fully obviously uh uncorrelated but to some extent at least in terms of geopolitical and other risks that they they have as minimal concentration as possible or excuse me as min as minimal um uh sort of overlap or relationship as possible yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense and uh let me ask you a question so let's say theoretically you have five stocks in the portfolio and, you know, some of them, let's say, theoretically, you know, they go up by a little bit, but one of them does extremely well. And let's say, you know, it's five, 10 X's. And now all of a sudden you're finding that, let's say, it's more than 50% of your portfolio. It's 60, 70%. Do you have sort of a cap where you'll say, okay, we're only going to let it be this much of the portfolio. And then we're going to like start selling. So it stays under this limit or do you just yeah. let, let it keep running? It's a great question and an age old debate that I don't know if anyone has a perfect answer to. Um, we, we have a sort of a theoretical cap uh, in our mind, maybe, but I, I, I uh, something around 35 or 40 percent, where obviously at that point, the uh, it needs to come under greater scrutiny, um, that, that, that uh, individual position. Um, but again, obviously, uh, just by, by getting to that percentage doesn't necessarily mean it should be sold. It may still be the best. Um, you know, risk reward value proposition, most, uh, you know, compelling investment you have. And therefore, you know, we, we find sort of limits where someone says, oh, it can only be 10% and they have to keep selling it every time it goes above that. That to us doesn't make a lot of sense. At the end of the day, there, there shouldn't be, uh, at least in theory, a, 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 you know, a hard sell limit. But of course, you know, uh, we're, we're managing our money and our partner's uh, capital. And so you, you need to uh, keep that in mind from a risk tolerance perspective. And, and uh, obviously keep in mind that, um, you know, uh, risk can come out of nowhere where you, you don't necessarily expect them. So uh, even though you you think one stock ABC is the best thing you've ever seen, uh, you, you know, uh, something could happen the next day that, that uh, you totally didn't expect. And in relation to that, what does your portfolio uh, turnover tend to look like? Yeah, the, the turnover um, has been something about 20% um, historically, uh, with, with a few minor exceptions, I, I guess, around COVID period, we, we changed uh, sort of getting into the new uh, VanChap 2.0 uh, strategy. But I, but I would say um, going forward, we'd be hopeful that probably be even less than 20%. Um, again, owning these businesses for you know 10 years uh, to us, uh, assuming they're continuing to grow and perform as we expect makes all the sense in the world, if not longer. And so um, in that way, the, the lower the turnover, the better. It, it means we've made fewer mistakes and have picked better, you know, made better investments. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any, um, let's say, industries or sectors that you tend to just avoid entirely because you feel like they're not within your circle of competence? Yeah. So again, uh, with the idea of the sort of overriding theme of having an open mind and so on, we, we used to, um, the answer used to be to that, that we would generally avoid technology, whatever that means, uh, healthcare and defense. Um, I, I would say, again, we're, we're trying to learn and, and uh, expand our circle of competence. Uh, healthcare is still sort of a, a difficult area for us uh, just because uh, you probably figured out we're not doctors. And so um, we think that there are folks in the world that have a better edge uh, than us in terms of understanding a given um, uh, you know, drug or, or therapy or whatnot. Again, that's not always the case. There are some things that we can understand. Uh, defense and, and sort of government contracts, we've been cautious just because we've had some bad experiences. Obviously, some, some government official or government agency can all of a sudden decide to end a, a contract without necessarily having a legitimate or, or logical reason to do so. So we've been a bit cautious there. On the technology side, um, you know, as we've discussed, uh, we, we've really tried to open our mind. And I, and I think um, we, we don't understand all uh, technologies and we, we can't sort of understand um, and analyze all of the different business models out there, but we've tried to come, uh, I think, quite a bit a long way over the last few years and really understand what, what, is, what these businesses are, uh, why the customers want them so badly and, and um, you know, the, the, uh, the dynamics within an industry and, and what they should look like going forward. So, so um, that's a long answer to the question, but I, I would say we, we're trying not to have any uh, do not invest uh, industry lists, uh, but, but um, th those are some of the areas where uh, in healthcare and, and defense where we have tended at least historically to be cautious. Yeah, absolutely. And we spoke a little bit about uh, Kazakhstan before, not about, uh, not just specifically for Kazakhstan, but let's say for places and the inflation 
there from my understanding, it's about six, 7%. But for those types of places, let's say where it's not hyperinflation, but it's also, let's say, you know, not the low, inf well, now inflation has been much, much higher recently, but let's say historically, you now most of these developed countries have had sure. much lower inflation. Um, how do you think, how, how does it differ between, let's say, thinking about a country where, um, you know, typically they've had, uh, let's say they're more for Western European country and typically they've had lower inflation compared to, let's say, more for an emerging country that, let's say, has uh, more, let's say, about 10% of your inflation, maybe even a little higher than that. Yeah, sure. So again, um, not that there's any complete science to this, science to this, but I, I would say generally speaking, obviously, uh, the higher inflation, the higher risk, the higher cost of capital in a given country means that you should have a higher payoff, uh, a higher return over time in, in dollar terms in, in um, that, uh, you know, by, for investing in that country. So one way to look at it is, um, you know, to look at history and, and uh, to your point, if the currency is depreciated uh, by 10% a year uh, over the last five or 10 years or whatever, um, uh, and you think that a company may double, we should incorporate, you know, in, in local terms, then we should incorporate that depreciation and therefore it may not hit our return hurdles. And, and so effectively what we're doing is you're raising the bar in the, in the most risky countries and then having it sort of trying to sort of even the playing field uh, across the countries. Obviously, Europe is quite safe, but not maybe quite as safe as the US or, or UK or something like that. And so um, that's what we're trying to do. If, if you want to go into Kazakhstan, you you know, an investment in Kazakhstan should really uh, make the catch register ring, as, as Buffett would say, and, and uh, should not be sort of a, a five to 10% a year uh, compounded annual return. Absolutely. And for a concluding question, um, what do you feel has been the most influential events in your investing career? Uh, I, I would say um, two things. I, I would say some of the people that uh, we've met along the way, um, you know, as you probably experienced uh, speaking with some of them, they, they tend to be, um, it's, it's a close knit community um, that, that people try to help each other and, and share ideas and think and learn. And so in that way, it's, it's been uh, terrific. Um, I, I would say, I, I mentioned Scott Barbie, who was a, a mentor, uh, you know, early, early on in my career and, and my partner, David Shapiro um, and, and others that, that um, uh, Tom Saber, again, who uh, used to work for Acri and, and other, uh, other folks um, are, are friends at Broad Run. Um, I, I would say um, on, um, uh, so that that's sort of been that, and, and I would say the other element that maybe one of the, the, the things that teaches you most quickly is is the uh, difficult periods, right? So I, I started in the business in the financial crisis. I, I started uh, as an intern on February 1st, 2009, uh, I guess um, uh, 13 years ago or so, and uh, today, and and uh, at that point, you know, all hell was breaking loose. I remember coming to the office and, you know, the stocks were down 20% uh, or, or something like that. And and so you, Seth Klarman at Balpost talks about how often your, your orientation throughout your career is based on when you get into it. So I, I think for, for better or worse, that maybe um, uh, colored my, my, my orientation. And obviously, um, you know, COVID and, and the period and this, the panic sell off in, in 2020 also teaches you a whole bunch of lessons. So it, it's hard to, uh, to boil down, but I, I would say the, the people we've met along the way, and then some of the, uh, the more difficult experiences that have also, uh, have also been um, extremely helpful. Though the one thing I neglected to mention is our, our uh, founding investment partner is Markel Corporation, and and so obviously uh, we wouldn't be here with, uh, or we wouldn't have at least started without their their uh, support. And and um, you know along the way they've been terrific partners. So that, that uh, um, I, sh I sh uh, neglected to mention them in, in some one of the, the pivotal moments in in our career. It's very interesting, actually. Can you talk about their relationship a bit more with Markel? Yeah, sure. So um, they're they're a shareholder of our firm and and uh, one of our larger investors. They, um, uh, as you may know, they, they've uh, they're a third generation business effectively, and and have, uh, for lack of a better description, tried to replicate the success of Berkshire Hathaway by building global insurance operations um, and reinvesting the float from from those insurance operations into public securities and also private businesses. And um, um, yeah, so that, that's basically the, the idea there. They're, uh, they've done a very successful job at that. They, they went public, I think, in 1986 at $8 a share. And today, the stock's probably about 1200 uh, something along those lines. And, um, and um, um, yeah, so, so it's been a terrific relationship. Um, we, we try to be helpful to them in, in any way that we can in terms of finding ideas on the public or private side. And, and um, obviously, they're very supportive to us as well. So, so that's, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great um, um, it's been a great partnership over these last 10, 10 or so years. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a really terrific session, and we really appreciate you taking the time and your busy schedule to meet with us today. No, it's, hi, it's, it's been really my pleasure, uh, and I, I appreciate the, the great questions, all the research you did, and um, thanks very much for your time. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I really, really appreciate it. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Itai. Take care. Yes, all right.